trees, you took what I had. I played my love blind. I took all of the reason out of the rhyme. Why did I go and throw it all away? Too much damn confusion. Just no good, no good, no good For nobody but myself For nobody but myself I told her that my life Was real tough at the time She told me that she owned it Wanted to explore these arms of mine As we danced by the fire Sip crystal as I told her about my life Told her about my children Even told her about my wife Why did I go And throw it all away Too much damn confusion No good, no good, no good For nobody but myself For nobody but myself Break it down, I gotta rap to him, y'all You see, we've been kicking it for about six months And things were really getting out of hand I was coming home late and running out of excuses And she'd been waiting patiently for me to leave my wife And I'd been stalling, trying to have the best of both worlds So one night, after work, we were having dinner on the other side of town And I could see that she had something she wanted to say to me But the words she could not find And just as she began to mumble me the words that she'd found somebody else And that it was over Out the corner of my eyes, I saw my wife walking through the door I was busted and left with the bill. Why did I go? Radio, and as always, this is our special Sunday musical guest interview. And we have an absolutely outstanding artist to introduce to you today, if you have not heard of him already. But if you haven't, you should have. Carrie, uh, could you let us know who this wonderful gentleman is? I am delighted to introduce to our viewers the wonderful Bruce Mississippi Johnson. He is uh, bo was born in good old Delta of Mississippi, a uh, musician, singer, and he's traveled quite a bit, uh, especially living in Paris, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Bruce, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You've been looking forward to this yes. for a long time. <laughs> yeah. we, we really have. So, Bruce, you grew up in good old Delta area of Mississippi. Uh, talk a little bit about growing up and where how you started musically speaking? Uh, music came later, but I grew up in a place called Starkville, Mississippi, uh, not too far away from where Howling Wolf 
was born. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up there. I didn't sing as a kid. My grandfather was a pastor, so I grew up in his church, basically. Uh, if you grow up in a in a pastor's house, household, you will be going to church every Sunday, twice a day. Oh, for yes. All, for all of your life if you stay there. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so I did all of that. That was a that was a part of my upbringing, um, old school upbringing, respect for your elders uh, and all of that. You know, I grew up hauling hay was my first job, you know, making my first pennies was hauling hay. Uh, so a real Southern boy. And then when I was about 10 years old, I met my father for the first time because I didn't, I wasn't raised by my parents. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they had me too young and I ended up, you know, being left with the great grandmother and grandfather and all of that. So. One day, uh, my father pops up out of nowhere at 10 years old, and he says, hey, I'm your dad. I'd like, like for you to come and meet me. I'd never met him, never seen him, never heard of him, didn't know his name. Next thing you know, I was uh, flying off to Indianapolis, Indiana to meet my dad. I think he came to pick me up the first time. So we flew off to Indianapolis together. I met his wife. Uh, I met a grandmother, seven aunts, three uncles that I'd never heard of, wow. never met before, and tons of cousins. Oh, how exciting. So, Although it sounds exciting, it was traumatizing because I knew no one and I was just sent alone and I knew no one. Were so, you very quiet at that time then? Yes, I was. I mean, I, you know, 10 years old, I was, I think I was quite shy anyway, but I think that didn't help things. And being a country boy in the North, you know how kids are. They are, they are ruthless. They will not be nice to you. If you <laughs> no, that's accident. true. It, you know, They'll so, make fun of you, tease you, mercilessly. Yeah, everything. It was just terrible. So I went through <laughs> oh. that. I was happy. Yeah, I was happy to have a dad. I was happy to meet my dad and uh, and live with him. And then, you know, and I adjusted to the city. And I, um, as I've done a, quite a few interviews lately, I kind of have some of the stuff at the front of my mind. One of the first moments, I think what got me hooked into music, uh, when I think about it now, is that I was, I was disrupting a class that I was taking in high school. And the teacher told me to shut up, but he said, but you do have a really nice baritone voice, go meet my friend, the choir director. Ah. So, I, so I moseyed on down to the choir director's uh, room and asked if I could join the choir, he said yes. Um, and uh, then I was on the, on the high school choir, and then at the same time, there was a, a talent show going on, and there was, a, there was a, one of my uh, classmates, she was a female, uh, she had. She was going to do a duo with the guy, and the guy pulled out at the last minute. And all of a sudden, some sort of way, I was on her radar, and she came and said, "Could you do the show with me?" I had already had my first uh, experience on stage when I was in Mississippi. I must have been about, I'd say, twelve years old, eleven, twelve years old. I went on stage and I try. I lip synced to James Brown's Soul Power, and I <laughs> looked out into the audience, and I was so terrified that I was just, I was just paralyzed. I couldn't open my mouth. I couldn't move. That was my first experience on stage, but I wasn't singing. But So next thing you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm being invited to do this talent show and I get out on stage and we're singing this duet from a thing, from a group, I think it was called the Soul Train Gang, the group from Don Cornelius, Soul Train. Mm -hmm. I remember Soul that, Train. oh yeah. And they had a song called, um, uh, how that song go? I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, but anyway, it was a duo and then she starts singing her part and then my part comes and I start singing and it was the first time ever that I'd had any sort of validation as, as an individual in the city. Even in my life, all of a sudden I got responses that I never dreamed of having. Like the girls started screaming and it was, it was I just, it, wow. I was just- you were shocked, I bet. I was shocked because I, I finally felt that I existed. Because I'd, yes. I'd, I'd grown up in the South with, with hardcore family members that were not very warm and fuzzy. Um, the things they said were meant to be good, but they were tough. You know, they were just, hurtful. You know, hurtful, yeah. hurtful. Just people that had grown up hurt mm -hmm. and that would pass on the hurt. So, uh, yes. so this was a chance for me to all of a sudden feel like, wow, I can do something. I can do, I'm somebody. I have a question to ask you, yeah. Bruce. Um, okay, you, you, your teacher said, go to the choir director. You go there. He says, okay, you can be part of this. Did you need instruction or did you find that basically this was something that was inside of you all the time? And it never just had took... Yeah, I, I never had I never had instruction. No one ever gave me anything. I mean, I mean, you know, um, to be honest, I have I've grown up around a million people that know how to sing. The only yeah. difference between them and me and amazing singers is that they didn't have the desire to be professional. But they had the talent. 
every time you go to a family a family get together, somebody wants to sing, or somebody wants somebody to sing, and they start mm -hmm. singing, and you're like, and and when I've gone back after living in Europe for 30 years, and I go back to these these same parties that I used to go to, and someone steps up to sing, they are really singing. They're singing as good as professionals that I know, mm -hmm. or even better than me. But they just do not have the vision or the opportunity to possibly be uh, step into the professional side of things. They just mm -hmm. do it because they can, but they don't have this plan to make it a profession because maybe you grow up and you think, oh, I'll never become a professional because in America, talent is so deep that you'd have to be really, really good to think that you could go out and beat some of the guys in the soul field or whatever field you may sing in. All right. So, so I've always kept it real. You know, I do what I do. I've ended up being a professional singer in Europe and uh, I'm doing it. I love it. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I taught myself to write my own music and my own lyrics, and I met people along the way that helped me uh, with constructive criticism. Or, you know, I was uh, when I when I left the Marines in Paris, France, I worked with a lot of uh, expats who had worked with the best jazz musicians ever. So I started out singing jazz. So I mean, I literally worked with a guy. I'm always amazed by this. I actually worked with a guy who worked with Glenn Miller, who is on the recording of In the Mood, the original recording. Wow. Oh. Oh. So, so I would hire. I hired him to work with me. Imagine I worked, that. I, I hired um, uh, Stan Getz's drummer, uh, uh, Keith Jarrett's bassist. All of these guys were guys that kind of were there when I was getting into the the the, the business, you know, and they were. They were old school and they were hardcore and I'd say, can we rehearse? And they say, you're not paying me, so you learn what you got to do. And when you come on stage, you count it off and we play. And that's the way. <laughs> wow. Cool. That's, that's, that's what it was. And, you know, so you go on stage and you're like terrified that you're going to make a mistake. And yeah. you would make a mistake from time to time and they would not miss that mistake. They would not miss it. So, uh, they'd call you on it. Huh? Uh, they'd call you on it. On the spot, in public, they would do it right then, then and there. So. <laughs> That's so, so cool. That's cool. Yeah. So you uh, you got a, you performed in Africa. Talk a little bit about that experience. Okay. Well, Africa was where it all started professionally. Uh, I was stationed there. I served seven years as a Marine. Um, I was uh, like I said earlier. I was first. I was in Southern California, down in Oceanside, in Cap Pendleton. Then I was transferred to Hawaii, where I lived for three years. And from Hawaii, uh, my contract was up. I'd done my four years. I didn't have anything that I thought I wanted to do or nothing was calling me so I re-enlisted and I re-enlisted for what we call embassy duty so I became a guard for for embassies mm -hmm. and my first post was in Kinshasa Zaire which is now the Congo but yes. then it was called it was called Zaire so I ended up in Zaire um, I was on the dance floor one night in the club um, slow dancing with some lady and I was just singing in her ear and she was like, oh, you have a really nice voice. I want to introduce you to some friends of mine who have a band. So she int introduces me to this African band and I, I go and I meet them and a Marine friend friend of mine had turned me on to Gil Scott Heron. I, I'm sure you guys have heard of him. Oh, yes. Scott Heron, yeah. Oh, yes. And I started covering his songs with this African band and getting paid for the first time as a musician while I was still a Marine. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's wow. So, um, we want to talk a little bit about your transitions in uh, into Paris and the music scene. Yeah. Uh, but first, can we take a break, Monica? And play oh, yeah. I think it's we'll time to right listen now. to the sun. Is more of this great music. We'll be back shortly to speak more with Bruce Johnson. Oh, I can't shake it, yo. Oh, come on, man. Mm -mm, I can't do it, man. I'll give it a try. Coming to ya on a southern breeze. Cornbread and collard greens, catfish and black eyed peas, baptized in a river, a granddaddy's hands, a ripped out of the country. Inside me, she still stands, she stands. Uh, I can shake my pains, I can shake the rain, but I can't shake the blues. I can't shake the blues. Grew up on James and Aretha, too. Then came BB. I knew that I was through. Ain't no way that the thrill is gone. As long as I'm living inside me, she lives on and on. Uh, I can shake my pains, I can shake the rain. Say it. I can shake my pains, I can shake the rain. I can shake my pains, I can shake the rain. But I can't shake the blues.
finest inside me Foods and cultures, beauty at lips So let me now and then, I gotta find myself some ribs I can't shake it, yo Come on, Bruce I told you I can't do it, man Gotta let it go, man I, I can't shake it I can shake my pains, I can shake the rain Say it I can shake my pains, I can shake the rain We are having a wonderful interview with uh, Bruce Mississippi Johnson. He's from the Delta area of Mississippi, singer, songwriter, traveler, uh, marine, just just done so many amazing things. So you got to Paris, I believe, uh, through the through the Marines. What drew you to performing and working in Paris? Because that's such a beautiful city. Gosh. Yes, it is. Well, initially it was because of the Marines that I went there. Because uh, when I was in Africa, I, in embassy duty, you back then you'd had three choices of a, a good post and a hardship post, they called them. So Zaire naturally was considered a hardship post. And my three uh, choices of a good ship was Paris, which was, I think, may have been my second choice. I chose Brussels, Paris, and Luxembourg. I got Paris. I landed in Paris on the, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was the 2nd of December, 1982. Uh, I get to the embassy. I discover this city. I'd never been to Europe. I'd never seen a city like that in my life. I mean, I remember you get off the plane. No one had come to pick me up. It's like, it, was, it was a bit of a uh, confusion because no one knew that, knew that I was arriving. But anyway, I get there. I'm picked up, I go driving down. I don't know if you guys know Paris, but there's a street called the Rue de Rivoli. It's in front of the Tuileries. And it's just nothing but lights, old school lamps oh, down the whole wow. street. I've seen so, photos, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, yes. Never been so, there, but go ahead. So I, re I remember that. I remember driving, then I drive and end Beautiful. up, you know, in front of the embassy and I get out and, and my life starts in Paris. And uh, I, you know, although I'd done the stuff in Zaire, I don't know if it had really dawned on me that I would, that would be my savior from the military where I wasn't really where I, I knew from the beginning that I wasn't a career military man. You know, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a career military man, I think if it's too much of an effort 24 seven, you're probably not made for it. You know, if you got to be ready for all of the inspections and all of the discipline and all of all of that, you got to be ready for it. Your mind has to be empty to be led, not questioning and all of that. So all if right. you're not ready to do that, don't go. So anyway, um, so I started there. Uh, one of my Marine buddies was taking piano lessons. He spoke to me about a guy who, who he was studying with, who also taught, taught voice lessons. So I took my first singing lesson with this, this gentleman from uh, Memphis and, uh, he liked my voice. He said, you have a great voice. Um, 
I book a club, I book such and such a club. It was a place called the Hollywood Savoy. If you get a jazz repertoire together, I'll book you. And he knew that I was getting out of the Marines. So I started learning my jazz repertoire because I knew nothing of jazz. I started listening to Lou Rawls, uh, uh, Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Sarah Vaughan, Ella Fitzgerald, all of the greatest. Yes. And I started pick, uh, finding songs that, that communicated to me. Um, and uh, then I started gigging in Paris. I started, but it, was, it wasn't professional. I was just going and hanging out at this place called Hollywood Savoy where all the stars that would come through town would come through. I mean, once I, I was at the Hollywood Savoy, I, I, would, I was already out of the Marines and I performed for Cary Grant, uh, Kathleen Turner, um, oh. you know. Yeah, so, um, so I was there and- What great memories, so I just, yeah. I know, I know. So, so I, uh, I just took it to another level and I just found my way out. I found my way out of the Marines and into a new career uh, and I didn't look back. Um, so Paris, Paris was really good to me. I know you guys have probably read that I also, at one point I had my original band and um, mm -hmm. we were invited to a competition, Jack Daniels music competition uh -huh. in a place called Border France. Uh, we went to Border France. The competition was chaired by Nina Simone Ooh. and and a, a big band, a big band French musician. Anyway, we won the competition, and I won I won uh, first prize, which was recording a single. So I recorded one of my original songs as my first single. Yeah, to be so it, excited about that. Yeah, oh. yeah. You know, you know, I'm more excited <laughs> about it now than when it was actually happening because. Yeah. I'm standing in front of Nina Simone, I'm performing for Nina Simone, but I did not uh, have to say uh, with, a bit of, uh, with a bit of shame that I didn't know the depth of her importance in the music uh, world. I didn't discover it until after she passed, really. Under to understand, I think you have to, well, me personally, I had to be in a certain frame of mind to get a, uh, a performer like that. I had, to, I had to let go of a certain sort of listening to a certain sort of singer, which may have been in pitch all the time and not, because Nina Simone was real, she was raw. Yep. She had emotion for days. And when you think of some of the people that you listen to from the Motown period, I mean, I think you could find raw emotion more in jazz singers possibly than soul singers. Soul singers were smooth and slick. Mm -hmm. so Nina Simone, and I was into that, but when you heard Nina Simone, she was, she was a storyteller. She had a way of telling things and, and it didn't have to be beautiful, but it was powerful. And now I can say that I love that direction. I love that direction of truth of if it's not, if it's not pitch perfect, who cares? As long as you're telling a story. You, you know, that is so true. Yeah. Because it's the connection that you have with the listener or the, or the viewer. Yeah. That's important. Because you're telling a story. I mean, songs are stories, most Absolutely. of them anyway. Some aren't, but a good song's a story. And if you get that message that you're trying to say across to someone and make that connection, there's nothing more powerful no, or more there rewarding, actually, as a performer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, was, I felt um, my years in Paris, I spent all those years in Paris, 20 years in Paris, performing for people that hardly could understand English. So I spent a lot of time performing for Euro Europeans whose, whose first language was not English, who didn't get, um, I was, not that I'm doing the poor me thing, but I, I often felt that as I am not, um, uh, what would I say, um, like the type of singer that would come in and blow the walls off of a house in my uh, whether it, in my embellishment of a melody or in my range or in my <clears throat> style, I'm not one of those kind of singers. I think that if I had to describe myself, I would say that I'm a singer that, like I said earlier, I concentrate on, more on truth and simplicity because I'm a bass, first of all. And, and if, you <laughs> yeah. can, if you can cite one bass singer that you've ever heard that can sing like a Beyonce or like a Stevie, let me know because I've not heard any. I the Gregory either, Porter. But yeah, yeah. I bass think it's a vocal is, card thing. Bass yeah, is one of the most unique, though, I think. I, yeah, I, I know. love to hear bass singers. But where are they? They're all dead. Yeah, we don't hear any in pop music. We that's, true. That. that's true. That's true. I know. I mean, you know, that's, you don't hear a bass singer in, in, in pop. You don't hear it. I mean, um, when I but heard Gregory Porter. Yeah, but I need to be out there. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm, I'm slowly getting out there, and yes. the the the... Uh, there, I have to make a reference to a book that I love. It's called the, the Road Less Traveled. I seem to be on the road less traveled. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Oh, I hear that. <laughs> so, 
uh, you started getting kind of a craving for a, a, a little earlier sound, uh, something more akin to the music that came from the Delta region. Um, then you um, got together with Big Joe Turner. Talk a little bit about that and, and, and the music that happened with that. Well, when I met Big Joe, well, the blues uh, is kind of um, something I've been dealing with lately is a lot of the uh, press that I've been getting, some of the purists have thought that the music is not blues. Uh, one guy just read a, uh, an, um, a review the other day where the guy said, yeah, well, he's not blues. Uh, it's okay, this, that, and the other, but he's not blues. So um, when I met Big Joe, well, well, before I met Big Joe, there was a, a guitarist, a female guitarist who had played in my band for a while, and she... I played in my punk band and later on I didn't realize that she was into blues but she was really into blues music she had a band she had a friend that was going to front the band who couldn't do it for whatever reason so she called and said would you front my blues band and I said I'm not a blues singer she said well give it a try please listen to the demos so she gave me uh, she gave me like the history of blues she gave me like a suitcase full of cassette tapes with just all these songs she wanted to cover so <laughs> I discovered I discovered all of these blues classics that I'd never heard before and naturally for me um, blues is kind of like jazz you kind of need a key to have access for me to, to, to figure out where you fit in it you know because you can listen I can listen to a lot of blues like Big Joe's blues he was that was a, a, the best experience I'd ever had musically because it was the first time that I'd had to uh, just let myself be driven by someone else who needed control. Big Joe needed control in his band. He needed to say when the song started. He needed to say when it ended. He needed to say when the solo was going to be played by the musician. He needed that musician to not overplay. I mean, I've seen him stand in front of a musician. I watched him once stand in front of an amazing Japanese blues guitarist. Because that blues guitarist had had too much success in the show. He was blowing the socks off the public and they were loving him. Big Joe didn't like it. He stood in his face. He was a very big man and imposing. Stood in his face and looked at him as if he, he was saying, I dare you to play another solo like that. I dare you to uh. step out without me letting you do that. You know, so he was kind of, he was really old school in that sort of way. But what he gave me was, um, he had a blues that I think was more like maybe what would go on around Memphis because I know that he was from that area. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get his. I didn't like his blues so much. It was. It was. It was another sort of blues that was a little harder for me to get into. I found myself uh, defining my path when I started listening to Little Milton or Bobby Blue Bland or Albert Albert King. I started finding my blues in the funky, solely blues area. Era, awesome. Area. Sorry, more so than that old school uh, cold women warm with warm hearts and all that old school blues. Yeah. Um, Right. which Big Joe had me singing. But what he gave me was he would be there and he would give a compliment every now and then. He would hide behind his big hat. He's on his base. He's got his head down. And if he heard something he liked, he'd go, singing blues and dick his head, dick his head again. <laughs> that was it. So, but, he, but he was never giving me compliments. And I was starting to get peed off. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to get him to say something. And in, in the process of trying to get his approval, I took myself into a, a zone that I'd never been into on my own. That means that we were playing in a club. I remember my breakthrough. I, I call it a breakthrough. We were playing in a club in Athens, Greece for about a week every night. And Big Joe's there and we're doing this thing and, and the place is packed. And something about that, that, that gig was really special. I even have a photo on my wall. Uh, maybe I should, where is that photo? I should pull it out and show it to you. There is this photographer that was in the club and he'd lost his son in some sort of horrible fire and he was taking shots and he brought me this photo before we left Athens and I saw this photo and I saw myself as I'd never seen myself before in a photo and it's black and white and I was like you know so I, I, I realized that I found a zone that I'd never found on my own because no one was there to push me no one was there to say uh, do this do that and, and, and surrounded by the musicians that I mean the guitarist that I mentioned earlier I've seen him play a solo and cry like a baby Playing a solo, you couldn't imagine how beautiful it was. Mm. Tears running down his face from the beauty of, of what, you know, from his love of music. And he really, and he's still a great friend of mine. Um, so Big Joe gave me, uh, he gave me the blues, I guess you could say. He gave me something about the blues. He gave me some of the essentials of, you know, the blues. That's what I'd say he gave me. So you got together with uh, Turner's, uh, one of Turner's band uh, mates, a uh, keyboardist. Talk a little bit about that and how did that musical uh, thing develop for, for you? Okay, well, uh, in the band with, uh, with the guitarist who I mentioned called Amar Tadani, plays with a few blues people now in Paris, there was Johan Delgard, who's, um, who's uh, he's, uh, where's he from? Danish. 
Danish keyboard player called Johan Delgaard, who had uh, his story. I think he was in university and he wanted to be a musician, but he wasn't sure of something. And then he he ended up some sort of way meeting Big Joe, and Big Joe taught him the blues and everything about it. He ended up being the best blues organist in France a few years back. And and all and during those long twelve hour trips in an old van across Europe to go from one gig to the next, we would talk and then we finally I mean, Big Joe was so old school and so so distant and you know, something going on that he would build a bond within the musicians. It was mm -hmm. the musicians and there was Big Joe. It's sort of yes. like any it was you know, when you live in, in there. Yeah. yeah, you know when you live in a hardship place, like when I lived in Africa and that hardship in in the in the in in the city that they used to call it when you go out, they would call it um, culture shock trip. They would take you out to see how people live there and you would really see some hard stuff. But I don't think I've ever lived uh, with such intensity as being in a place where people, where the hardship of the, of the area made you have a tighter bond with the people around you. And Big Joe kind of was the hardship. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and the band and the band became very close. So right. in that in that closeness, uh Johan and I, we'd spoken a lot of times when we spoke about demoing some songs once we got a chance. We said, let's when we get back to Paris one day, let's write some songs. And one day he came over and I had my little home studio. We sat down. I don't know how long it took, but it seems like it would have been less than a month. We sat down and we wrote the album. We wrote uh we wrote eleven songs. We wrote twelve songs. And only one didn't make the album, and that was it. And we, it wasn't like we wrote 20 songs to find 10. We wrote, this, we wrote the album. We sat down and wrote the album in a few afternoons. Mm. So that's, wow. that's how that happened, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't wow. happen very often. That's, you, there's usually 30 songs, and then somebody yeah. you know, selects from them. Exactly. <laughs> if you've got so, the budget to write 30 songs, yeah. That, yes. that, exactly. <laughs> so, um, you, Bruce, you have a new CD out. Let's talk a little bit about it, and we'll, we can purchase it. Oh, I want to say something awesome. Oh, one Bruce, Bruce is from the UK now. He's not from Mississippi. I just wanted people to know that. Well, I live in the UK. Yeah, I'm looking at look at that little baby yes. jump across the screen. Oh, look at <laughs> this. Okay, the what's the deal name of this? baby. I love it. Why the did you deal call baby. it the deal, deal baby? That's an interesting title. Well, I kind of, you know, I like the song, uh, That's the Deal Baby, from the album. I loved uh, the way it it it. it, it was born in the way in, in the way it made its own little life and had in the groove of it and the whole story of it you know i, I love the humor because i think the blues is is a humorous music at times they've got some of the funniest lines you'll ever hear is in the blues or country music you know you get some funny lines so, uh -huh. so um so when i thought of the album i'm not uh very uh i'm not a big-headed person in any sort of way but i thought uh i thought I'm going to say that this album is the deal baby it's the deal baby the song is the deal baby so i was kind of suggesting that the album was the deal baby it's the real deal <laughs> yeah it's the real deal well it's a great um uh, so looking at that cd do you have a favorite song other than maybe deal baby that uh, kind of touched you when you wrote it or oh well that's well the song i mean as far as touching goes i would say that the most emotional song on the album which naturally uh, the story that will always remain with me was um, See You Tomorrow, which is the ballad, the last ballad on the album, which is based on a true story. Uh, it happened to me uh, with the person that I was uh, dating and living with when I finished the Marines. Uh, she had, uh, we had separated already for a couple of years, but anyway, she had gone to the States for the first time and she died in a car accident in the States. Oh, I'm sorry. So I took, I took uh, some of our breakup, which... Um, which had happened a couple of years before the accident, but I took our breakup and I, I merged it with her premature dying. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I came up with a song and there was a point where there were not a few years ago, a woman contacted me on Facebook saying something. I don't know if it was before I wrote the song or after, but she said that the last time that I danced with my brother, was to your voice, and after that night, he died in a car accident. So, 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 you know, she reached out, and then, you know, I, I, I said, I'm really sorry and stuff. So I kind of thought, um, kind of that a song like that could possibly uh, touch somebody in some sort of way. So, yes. so I sat and I ran through the details of our breakup, which was, which was like from a movie, and um, and then I just merged them together and and kind of. 
because when I the first time I heard um, Sun House, I have this. I don't know if you guys had the opportunity to watch Martin Scorsese's uh five dvd set on the blues did you get a chance to watch that no, no i would love but to I see it yes yeah, amazing you. them vendors did one thing on one section of the blues clint eastwood did something on blues piano someone else did something on this so all of them have done something on sections of the blues and it was the first time that i saw sun house and sun house was singing a song that i've added to my repertoire and a song that I think is one of the most powerful songs I've ever heard. And watching him sing it in the morning, the day that I discovered it, had me crying, sitting on the couch. And it's called Death, Death Letter Blues. And, ah, yes. Yeah, and in that song, he's just... He's yeah, just, I've heard that song. Yeah, yeah. it's great. And, and and when I heard that, and then I wanted I wanted my Death Letter Blues. I wanted um, to have something that kind of, you know, kind of a shout out to that person for having, you know, left the earth earlier than they should have. Right. So that's there. And then... Then on, on the lighter notes, I mean, I had an experience uh, on one of the songs called Mojo. That's based on a true story where a woman tried to put voodoo on me to make me love her. So that story, that's, 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 that's that story. That's, that's, so that story, that's, that's, that story, that's story inspired Mojo. No good was just any anybody that cheats and gets busted was Mojo. The deal, baby, was kind of kind of like a joke to my wife um, about her shopping on eBay and this and the other. Uh, so all of them, um, all of all of the babies, or they all have, they're all based in something truthful about them. You know, uh, the neighbor next door has something to do with something that I lived. Um, I'll bleed is temptation. A freak on or die is sex. It's you know. So I was just looking at these things. I was just letting my imagination run and trying to give depth to who I am, you know, and what I want to say. It's a, it's a beautiful CD. I, I, I just love all the songs. Now, um, speaking and that's of saying music, something, to it, like it, yes. all the songs on a CD. Yes. Yeah. I, because I, a lot I, of times you might like a couple, and the other ones are okay, but yeah. these are so, fantastic. Nice. So speaking of music, uh, Bruce, where can we find your music? Well, you can get the physical CD. Where was that? What's that? What's that? What's that? There it oh, is. There it is. There it is. The deal, the deal baby. <laughs> That's the deal. Uh, you can get the. You can order physical copies signed if you like from my website at www.brucemississippijohnson.com, and uh, if you want to just download it, you can get it from most of the digital platforms. You know, like Amazon or iTunes or okay. any of those places. I've got it all over the place, all over the net. So those are your two places to get it. But to get the physical copy, you can only get it through me. Are you touring at all? Or are you playing mm -hmm. locally? Are you touring at all in your area? Or Oh, this that's been the hard part. Um, been in London since 2004, but I was uh, gigging to survive for a long time. And I still gig to survive, which means you're doing cover gigs and you're doing yeah. wedding, weddings or concerts or whatever you have to do to remain a musician and to survive. So in the process of doing that, I had a... I was dug deep into the south of Italy, doing a lot of work in the south of Italy when I moved to London. And that delayed my getting into the scene here in London because, you know, paying the bills and this time the other gets in the way. It uh, does. You know, life gets in the way, doesn't it? Yeah, life gets in the way. And uh, so that kind of delayed me getting into the people that I need to meet here. So we're playing catch up with my manager at the moment, looking for booking agents anything gigs tours i've got a gig on sunday um i did a i did my album launch in a place called the 606 which is a club that's been open probably 40 years in london yeah a uh, very good music club run by a musician um lovely people you know you go over and uh they present the show and they present the cd if you've got it just, just they feed you they they pay you the whole thing is you know a good situation yes um so he called to, to get me to come in and uh, to fill a slot that someone had left open so i'm going to take my band down on sunday great play the album uh play some of my favorite songs from like little milton freddie king uh, some of the other people and uh, and we're just looking. We're actively looking to get our noses into whatever well, sure. we can. The people have to hear you. They just haven't had that opportunity yet. And I think once right. they do that, they're going to fall in love with you just like Carrie and I have. And everybody that actually I have presented your music to has adored it. Oh, wow. Thanks. That doesn't happen that often. Mm. I, that's another thing. I think that your sound, it's rather universal. I can't. I can't. All know. ages. I just, Mm. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Well, I, I would hope so, but I mean, 
I can't, I, I can't, I just have to step back and let people decide what it is for them, you know, because I can't That's right. say, you know what I mean? I can't say, I don't know what it is. Exactly. I don't know. I just, I just give up what it. I can give up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, being in the music business for a while, and I just want to ask this as a last, last question. Um, what advice would you give to somebody struggling like you have? What would you tell them? Buckle up. <laughs> Buckle up. That's all I can say because uh, I've I've toured with pop stars, with, you know, as a backing vocalist with French pop stars. Um, I I don't know if you guys read it, but I was uh, I did The Voice in France back in 2012. From that, I thought I'd never do that. I got a call. I said, "Don't be a chicken. Do it." I said, I never subject myself to that after all these years of performing. I, I accepted. I went. I accepted the challenge. I went. Uh, made it to the first battles, came out confused, upset, uh, didn't get a chance to express myself, didn't get a chance to do anything that I really wanted to do. They had the list of songs that they you could choose from, they had the clothing, they had everything sorted out for you. Yeah. Was it like I thought it would be? So came away from there thinking that it hadn't really given me anything other than the courage to, to jump without seeing the net. And uh, maybe a year or so later, uh, the production company contacted me, asked me if I'd want to be a part of a... Um, a Rat Pack tribute that they were doing with some French pop stars and myself. Oh, I'd love to see that. Oh, so what started out to be uh, three singers ended up being 15, 14 <laughs> pop stars, with including Paul Anka and myself. Uh, wow. That that went triple platinum. Um, the second album that we did did well. They brought in Michael Bublé on the second album. Oh, yeah. So, so I did that. I did all this stuff, and still I can I cannot say right now that i am locked into anything i'm just i just still feel like i'm trying to make my way so anybody that's going to go for it uh, yes it's not easy if you've got the well, contacts you know but it, you never know what's going to happen around that next corner right no you don't so and just I be ready figure that yeah. the reason that you're here right now at this time and moment because there is so much more that's coming your way you know, and you've got the talent, and um, you've got the perseverance, and I just can't wait to hear what you have next. And I hope that you will let us know as soon as you get more so, because I'm we, we stream your music as much as possible. <laughs> oh, I love it! Because um, it, it's different. You know, I can get a, a not. I'm not putting anybody down. Believe me, but I get a million rock songs. I get a million pop songs. I get rap songs. You know, country songs. But how many songs like yours do I ever get the opportunity to present to people? You know, oh. very few, and people love it. Oh, that's great! So hopefully that'll uh, that'll find its way around, get into God's ears, so He can do His magic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I would say just to, just to answer that question, I would say that if anybody wants to get into the music business, just come in, do your thing, be truthful to yourself. Right. And try to be prepared for the moment that the window may open. And if you can, jump in there and try to take it to another level. That's all I can say, really. That is, that's beautiful and it's true. And, and oh, gosh, that, we just want to thank you so much for joining yes. us. It's, it's oh, been thanks, a, guys. Thanks, ladies. It's been, it's, yeah, and thank you for creating wonderful music yes. that a lot of people would not get the opportunity to hear, and now they can. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> you keep in touch with sure. us and let us know what's going on. Yes, I be will sure. do. Be sure to contact Monica if you have some new music. She'll be very happy to stream it. We stream okay, cool. our show six days a week, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, and on TV Live. And uh, she would love to have your music. She'd love to oh. have your music. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you have I'll a special get it to you. Christmas one, send it our way because we're okay. going to have a special, okay? Also, Halloween, if you happen to have a spooky song for Halloween, <laughs> we're taking that too. Hey, could you see a blues, a blues song for Halloween? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> oh, that would be very funny. I think I'm a ghost. Think, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a ghost, but I was a person now. I'll tell you what, if, if I had if I had to improvise on that, I think that we've all had that the wrong partner on the other side that made us think of Halloween. So I'm sure you could find a blues song that would go with Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. But Bruce, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. Uh, you know, Dad, it's getting late there and you've got much to do. Oh uh, thanks. And, uh, you take care, okay? All right, thanks and for having keep me. On thanks. Bye. I will. I will, I, I promise. Bye bye. Lots of love. Bye. Thanks. 
Oh my goodness. Uh, amazing man, amazing talent. I mean, he's, he's so humble, Gary. I mean, he has, uh, I just love that about him. And what an exciting life he's led so far. Oh, yeah, Paris, Africa, oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so talented and, and I think I look at him and I see such a focused professional musician. I don't say that very often, folks. Um, but uh, he is, and he, he's going to do really well. I'd like to see him. Well, I, I just want to say to the people that are listening to the interview, it's time that we got more music like this back into our music industry. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any other music, but this is a type of music, and we don't want it to die. No. So I hope you'll be sharing the interview and um, checking out Bruce Mississippi Johnson for yourself. Yes, he's and on I'm Facebook. Ready for some more of his music, Carrie. I am. I am. Okay, sure. here we go, folks. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye. His woman, she cries As she worked through the night Going through his things and lies I'll never forget The look on his face As he pulled up at dawn Locksmith just driving away Well It's my tea peculiar Cause I thought they were the Joneses Appearances they can fool They don't always school ya The neighbor next door Oh, the neighbor next door His woman is here Is that your key that I hear in the back door? Perfect timing, baby Come on and help me, cause she ain't clear Then she hits me with that I've got a right to know About with whom she caught you At the motel A 45th and Rodeo To walk now, baby. I don't speak, I don't freak. You think that he will love you more? Joke is on me. I was the same sucker before. 
함께 The neighbor next door The neighbor next door Oh, the neighbor next door 